A deep curse ran through the Daly family. It haunted Frank and Nene Daly, and of which Barbara became a victim too. Along with unsurpassable beauty, mental vulnerability burdened her. She was pretty, power-hungry, and incredibly ambitious. Behind her feigned righteousness, there was a dark personality. She had vile manners, had excessive drinking habits, and subjected herself to drug abuse. Barbara and Brooks's marriage was not as perfect as it seemed from the outside. Her exasperated offensive outbursts, unstable character, and repeated suicide attempts had exhausted Brooks. She had visited the famous psychiatrist, Foster Kennedy, for therapy. However, her mental health never seemed to improve. Mingled with insecurity, multiple affirms, and tumultuous relationships, Barbara was leading a miserable life, despite the vast wealth. They weren't ready for a child, and their friends hoped they would never have one. However, they did, and Anthony Bakeland was born. Though he was perfect, smart, and dashing, he started showing disturbing signs when he was not even an adolescent. He was quiet, enjoyed examining and dissecting insects and other small animals. His drawings comprised of humans dripping blood. However, his father encouraged his psychopathic tendencies and praised his scientific talent. Barbara, who was self-obsessed, noticed how unusual her son was, but she paid no attention to it. His psychopathic tendencies made her love him even more. When Tony was 20 years old, he began an intimate relationship with an Australian bisexual man. Jake Cooper. Cooper was a man Barbara would never want her son to associate with. He was tall and handsome and into drugs. He lived with the hippies. Tony became drawn to Cooper because of his dark personality and started taking drugs. He became Cooper's creature. Barbara soon learned of this when she was in Switzerland from Tony's friend and drove to Morocco, where Tony was, to bring him back to Switzerland with her. However, Tony didn't have his passport with him and they had to spend the night in jail at the French border. Her marriage was falling apart. Brooks tried to leave Barbara several times only to encounter repeated suicide attempts. However, he soon got over it. Tony started dating a French girl named Sylvie. It elated Barbara beyond limits. She insisted several times that Sylvie marry Tony and always reminded her she would become rich if she did. She often went beyond her ways and invited Sylvie home for meals. However, the outcome of that was Sylvie married Brooks and took him from her. Brooks didn't falter in her threats of suicide attempts and left her with a divorce allowance. With time, Tony became prone to violent outbursts and aggression and became diagnosed with schizophrenia. He threatened his mother with knives choked her, and even pushed her in front of cars outside their family's residence. If only Brooks had helped Tony instead of refusing to let him see a psychiatrist who he viewed as amoral, he could have avoided the catastrophe that ensued. Barbara's controlling personality never abandoned the fact of Tony's homosexuality. To treat him she hired female prostitutes to sleep with him, but it proved fruitless. Before separating, she told Brooks 
she could cure Tony once she took him to bed with her. Barbara was the ultimate cause of her sufferings. At a dinner table, she suddenly revealed to her friends how she and Tony were sleeping with each other, and it was only to cure him. However, the people were used to her outrageous personality and did not consider it more than a joke. Gradually, Tony returned to his childlike state. He started tiger painting on his clothes and decorating his shoes with gold stars. Occasionally, he and Barbara would get into violent fights where the neighbors would have to call the authorities on them. One day they found Tony on the street with a knife, shouting about annihilating all women. He once threw Barbara into traffic, but a friend rescued her. The police arrested him for an attempt to murder, but Barbara refused to press charges against him and took him out of the psychiatric hospital, back in her care. After that, Barbara admitted Tony needed help but she couldn't afford any, as Brooks had stopped sending her allowance for maintaining him. However, she hired a therapist to visit Tony at home. The relationship with his mother troubled Tony. So, he tortured her. He hit her with a wooden walking cane once and even put a pen in her eyes. He smashed eggs on her face in front of guests at the dinner table and walked around without his clothes in front of people visiting the house. Though the therapist warned Barbara that Tony was capable of murder, she believed he would never harm her. But he did. After the murder, the authorities sent Tony to Brixton. However, he didn't fully grasp the situation and would ask the officials how his mother was doing and if she was still alive. Soon, he accepted the fact that his mother was no more and spoke of a significant burden that was lifted off his shoulders. John Mortimer, who described Tony as gentle and nice and tried to get him back to the US for mental treatment, defended him at the court. However, the jury found him guilty of manslaughter and sent him to Broadmoor. He spent his time there working in handicraft shops and having relationships with the male inmates and welcoming visitors. One visitor was Nini Daly, who only believed that her grandson was being unfairly detained. She started a campaign for his release led by the Honorable Hugo Moneycoots whose family controlled London's exclusive Coots Bank and whose mother-in-law was an old friend of the Bakeland family. Tony's case was discussed at the highest levels because of Coots' influence, with telegrams between the American Embassy in London and Cyrus Vance, the US Secretary of State in Washington. Eventually, in July 1980, they discharged Tony on condition that he was repatriated. However, Brooks did everything to revert his son's release, as he strongly believed that Tony was evil. As he had sent macabre toys made at the handicraft shop to his stepbrother and letters threatening to kill Sylvie. Tony was released and put in the care of his grandmother who had a broken hip and needed care around the clock. He was to fly to the US accompanied on the flight by two trained medical escorts, but this requirement somehow got lost in the discussions between the authorities in Britain and the US. Tony was at last accompanied by the daughter of his grandmother's friend who lived near Broadmoor. It was six days after they released him when Nini's nurse, Lena, came to the house and was waiting to be let in, but nobody opened the door. There was no reply either. After a while, Tony opened the door. 
Lena, quick, get the ambulance, he said. I've just stabbed my grandmother, he said, wearing only a pair of shorts. The police arrived at the scene only to discover Nini Daly on the floor, soaking in blood. She had been stabbed eight times. She won't die. The knife won't go in. And she keeps screaming. I can't understand it, said Tony as they grabbed him. They took him to the police station, where he told the police that he wanted to sleep with his grandmother. Tony was found guilty of murder and sent to Rikers Island. Nene Daly, however, survived as the knife had only hit the bones. Tony had a trust fund for which the other inmates preyed on him. Within a few months, he had given away 20,000 pounds as protection money and more as gifts to those who had relationships with him, including one of the male guards and an inmate who had raped and decapitated a young boy. On March 20th, 1981, he was taken to the preliminary hearing and informed that the court would discuss his case after a month once his mental health reports from Britain arrived. He was expected to be bailed, but the application was rejected. A little more than half an hour later, he was taken back to his cell. At 3.30 in the evening, Tony was found dead. His head was wrapped with a plastic bag, the same material whose invention had made the Bakelin family famous throughout the US. The tale of the troubled Bakelin family ended with the assurance that their demons would not be passed down further generations. Some people believed Tony had been murdered and some told he had committed suicide. Barbara's controlling personality had brought about the catastrophic incidents. Not only had she been very forceful about Tony and demanding on Brooks, but she had made her life miserable as well. Burdened by the incestuous relationship with his mother, Tony had assumed it was his role to destroy all women. Barbara Bakelin's tale is tragic indeed, with the existence of pride, greed, torture, and mingled with traces of psychological disorders.